Welcome, I'm Chris Harper. We would love the opportunity to connect with you in person. Every Sunday morning, 10 a.m., we gather here. Uh, every service, every Sunday experience is, is kind of unique and different with always Christ being at the very center of our worship. And we, we just think it's way more fun to follow Jesus together and to love our neighbors uh, because we're able to, to connect in person. So please uh, join us whenever you can. And uh, by the way, if you are an SWC family and or would like to give to the mission and work of SWC, we just would, we're grateful for, for your support. You can follow the prompts online. Uh, also, don't forget, if you're watching YouTube, you can cl click that little thumbs up thing. That's really good. So uh, we bless you. Seriously, as you receive the word of the Lord today, from the preaching. May God's spirit fill your heart with his goodness and a reminder of his great love for you. God bless. For God so loved the world, all of us, you and me. He loved us so much he sent his only son, Jesus, the firstborn of creation, sent to take our place, to bear our burden, to suffer our consequence. We were far from God, but God didn't want to be far from us. Jesus came to bring us home. As a prodigal returns to their father, so too could we return to our creator. A simple plan with just one requirement, belief. For whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have life, life eternal. At the very heart of God is love, indescribable, unrelenting, unstoppable love. That love shines a light, guiding us home. For God so loved the world. Good morning, Scottsdale Worship Center. Uh, my name is uh, Mahasimo James. I'm here with my beautiful mother and sister, Maria and Rhea. Today, we will be reading from Luke chapter 15, 11 through 24. And I ask if you are able to please stand for the reading of the Lord. <clears throat> And he said, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. Jumping down to verse 20, And he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Massimo, Maria, and Rhea uh, for reading the word. Good morning, church. Good morning. Uh, my name is Peter Nam, and I lead uh, our Impact College Young Adults and Missions. It's so good to be here. I'm so thankful so grateful uh, to be here today, and special thanks to Pastor Chris, our amazing lead pastor of the church. Can we give it up for Pastor Chris? And Pastor Jen, uh, it's amazing. You know, I learned so much from him. Uh, he's, he's gracious, slow to anger, and uh, very kind, so yes, praise God. All right, uh, let, me, uh, let me just pray for us before we start. Dear Heavenly Father, 
Lord, we love you. God, I just pray, Lord, as you have spoken to me, God, I pray that you will speak to your people, to my brothers and sisters who are here today. God, would you open up our eyes, our hearts, and our minds to hear your voice and feel your presence in this place. God, I pray that only you and you will be glorified, Jesus. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So today's topic is the back to school theme. It's a back to the father. We're going to look at uh, the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15 and find out what it means to go back to the father. And most importantly, that we get a chance to experience it together. Have you ever lost something that's very valuable to you and found it? So day three of humans uh, still think I'm lost. Uh, kind of looks like Winston, but it's probably like the baby form. Um, right after high school, the Lord changed my life by showing me the Great Commission. I still remember the day uh, when he taught me the, how we're uh, called to make disciples of all nations and that we preach the gospel to all nations, and that's when the end comes. We don't know exactly the time and the uh, uh, day, but the condition that our Heavenly Father has set is that until every nation has an equal chance to hear the gospel, he will not come back to judge the world. This really marked my life and changed the tra trajectory of my life. And I realized that this is something that worth dying for. It's not just for me, but for my generation and also for everyone who loves Jesus. So by the grace of God, uh, we went on some mission trips here and there, and I decided to transfer to ASU, which is number one party school uh, in the U.S., uh, I, I transferred there to do some campus ministries, and I know, as Pastor Chris mentioned, there's a lot of spiritual warfare, but as he also alluded to, there's a revival is happening. Uh, and we recently, with the uh, Asbury revival, I think there's a photo, yeah, and uh, I feel like that was just kind of the signal to all over the world for college campuses, high schools, and we hear stories after stories of how people are getting saved, getting baptized on campus, and there's a mighty move of God among the college campuses. And we have some Bible studies and discipleships on college campuses as well. And let's turn these party schools into number one party school for Jesus. Amen? So during this time, um, uh, when I went to the ASU, uh, I didn't have a car. So there's a, a picture of a bus. So a friend of mine gave me a bike, his bike. And uh, I commuted to school by taking the bus. It took me an hour and a half. I live in Ahwatukee, it's kind of the south. You know, it's not in Mexico, but just before there, there's somewhere it's called Ahwatukee there. It took me an hour and a half to get to school, which was a terrible idea, but I was just so happy that I had a bike. So for those of you who had never been to uh, the luxurious Metro City bus of Phoenix, uh, when you have a bike, you put the bike in front of the bus. There's a rack literally that comes down and you put the bike and you get on the bus. One day, I get off the bus, I was on the phone just like talking to someone, and I look back and I forgot to grab my bike, and then the bus left. So I was panicking because that was the only form of transportation that I had. So I didn't know what to do, I called the, the city bus, the Metro Valley, pretty much everyone for about an hour and a half on the phone, and they were pretty much telling me that there's no way I can find it because the bike has lost. So I stayed on the campus that night, uh, you know, all, all, pretty much all day, uh, just doing ministries and stuff like that. And then I remember taking the last bus. It was the last bus. It was probably like 10 o'clock something. And then I see this bus coming towards me with the light shining. And I see there's a bike in front of the bus. And I was like, there's no way. There's no way that's my bike. And it comes slowly, slowly, and it stops right in front of me. And I checked the bike, and it was my bike. And I was like, praise the Lord. I mean, what are the chances? You know, after all day, it was different driver, and I was just so happy. I was just jump with joy, filled with joy. And then I just could not help but share with the bus driver. It's like, man, you cannot, you will not believe what happened this morning. You know, I lost this bike, and I found it. Praise Jesus. And you know, sharing the gospel. And he's like, amen, brother. And 
you know, it was, it was amazing. And now uh, I'm happy to say that the bike actually is, I gave it to JT because he needed it. So every time I see that bike, it just reminds me of the goodness of God and his miracle uh, working God. Jesus shares a story in Luke 15, the joy of the Father uh, when the lost have been found. So let's look at Luke 15 together. Uh, the, we just got to look at briefly the context, which is vitally important. Uh, Luke 15, 1 and 2, as you heard, uh, now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear Jesus. And the Pharisees and scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So the tax collectors, uh, there were Jews who, were, uh, charged, uh, who would charge higher taxes and many more taxes uh, for the Rome and for their own benefits. So people hated them and uh, their, for their dishonesty and corruption. Uh, and the sinners, obviously, you know, people who don't keep the law of God. And I love how Jesus or Luke just kind of separates the tax collectors. These are like some different types of groups, you know, and sinners. So it's, imagine people that hate it by everyone, you know. And then, um, but these are the people that were coming to draw near Jesus to hear him. And I just love how Jesus' style and his character, how loving he was and how kind he was towards them. And there's the Pharisees and the scribes. The Pharisees, as many of you know, highly influential group of Jews, uh, experts of the law of Torah, meaning the first five books of the Old Testament. And the scribes are similar, that they focus more on interpreting the Torah. The problem is that they would make up their own laws and rules, and many more rules that don't even need it, and force others to follow, and falsely claiming that this is how you become righteous before God, which is crazy. So they were grumbling against Jesus. Why is Jesus hanging out with the sinners? He was supposed to be holy and set apart. So this is why the reason why Jesus is telling these parables. There are three parables. Uh, first two, we're not going to go into details, but first one is a lost sheep. A shepherd lost one lost sheep out of 100 sheep. He goes after the one and finally finds it and fills with joy, and he puts it on, uh, on, around his neck, and he comes back home. And the second one is the woman who lost a coin. Same thing. She, it was just very valuable for her. She searches it all day, and then finally when she finds it, she shares it with her neighbor, and she's so happy that she cannot help but share it with others, just like my lost bike that I found. And then the last one is the prodigal son. Fun fact, did you know that the story of the prodigal son is the longest parable ever that Jesus had ever shared? So it's a very important story and a lot of beautiful detail that Jesus wants us to know. So we're going to uh, look at verse, uh, chapter 15, verse 11 and 12 as Masma and his family beautifully read for us. Father had two sons. Is anyone firstborn in the house? I know some of you guys are the only child. Oh, we have a lot? Okay, all right. I'm the second, uh, you know, the youngest, the chosen one, obviously. <laughs> and uh, my brother and I, we fought a lot. It was just ungodly amount of fights, and it really concerned our parents. But then as we grew up, uh, when we went to college, we became best friends. So praise God. All my families are in Korea, by the way. So praise the Lord. And I know my parents are watching right now on the live stream. So shout out to uh, my parents. Thank you. So the younger one says, Father, give me the share, the verse 12, give me the share of property that is coming to me. Meaning the father is still alive and he's asking for his portion of his will. The younger son was shameless. And he was selfish. He didn't care about his father or his family. He just wanted his money. The crazy part is that the father actually divides the property between them. And he gives to the son. A half of the father's property. It was a lot of money. This man, you will see later, that he's a wealthy and a rich man. So half of his property was a ton of money. If he would have been an Asian dad, my goodness, you are gone, you know? Rest in peace. No more rest of chapter 15. You skip right to chapter 16. You know, Pastor Long probably can testify. But this father, 
because he's a gracious father. He allowed it. As I talk to some of our parents with travel, traveling children, or even adults sometimes, sometimes there's only so much that you can do. And sometimes there's nothing you can do but to wait and pray for them. And I just want to remind you to not to give up because your patience and prayers might be the only thing they have left for them. And I know that our Heavenly Father is waiting and praying with you and loves your children more than anyone and anything else. So verse 13, uh, not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and he squandered his property in reckless living. Not many days later, he didn't even wait. He gathered all he had. He probably converted all into cash, which tells me that he didn't intend to come back home because he took everything he had. He took a journey into a far country, and he squandered his property in reckless living. Not an investment. He didn't start a business. didn't invest into crypto or anything like that. He squandered it all in a reckless living. Drinking, gambling, drugs, sleeping around, you name it. He probably have done it all. And I love how Jesus describes what the prodigal son did. He squandered his property in reckless living. The word reckless in Greek in, it's, is an adverb, which is the same word for asotia, and it means abandon, dissolute life. He was so lost in his own selfish desires and gratification and abandon his identity of who he was and who he belonged to. When we are created in Genesis 1, when we read Genesis 1, we're created in God's image and his likeness. And I love how God comes down and breathes his life into our lungs, and that's how we become alive. And unfortunately, Genesis 3, the sin enters, and we become separated from our Father. This is a reality of our current state, that we were born separated from our Heavenly Father, our Creator, because of our sins. And just like a baby, uh, as you know, we have many babies, they would cry and cry and cry until the baby is united with his mother or father. It won't stop crying. So we have this natural hunger, this void in our hearts, and this belongingness to be with our Creator with our Heavenly Father. No matter what we do, until we are united with Him, until we encounter His love, our hearts will never be truly satisfied. So we try to escape and cope with other stuff. I have a question for you. What does a reckless living look like for you? Does it look like drinking, smoking, drugs, porn, or even food? Not only the obvious stuff, but anything that we do that makes our hearts abandon God as an escape. What about binge watching shows and movies? Doom scrolling on social media? Yeah, 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 I know. I used to play video games, uh, computer games a lot, so that was my reckless living. Uh, what does it look like for you? The most, and most importantly, how does it make you feel afterwards? We all know it will not truly satisfy us. It will not fulfill us apart from being with our Heavenly Father. So let's look at what happens uh, to the prodigal. Uh, verse 14 and 16, it says, When he had spent everything, a severe famine rose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. And no one, no one gave him anything. He had spent everything. He went all out. No reservation. He just spent it all. And the famine hits. He began to be in need. And no one helped him. It's so interesting. When he was rich, you know, he probably had a lot of friends. But when he became poor and in desperate need, everyone left him. So he hired himself out 
as a servant, as a slave to a Gentile, non-believing Jews. So this is, was very degrading. Uh, and it, it wasn't just a part-time job or anything like that. It's almost like you're becoming a slave to another uh, nation that's, who are not Jews, and you're becoming a slave to that person. And feeding pigs. Pigs also considered as an unclean animal, and you're not even supposed to be near it. So it's an abomination for the Jews, and they're called, as they're called to be set apart. So he went so far off. It was an utter humiliation, and it was completely lost. He was completely lost physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, financially, and even relationally. When I was reading through to this, I was like, man, what a stupid guy, you know, younger son, come on, you can do better than this. And then I felt like the Lord was gently asking me, how far have you gone, my son? How far have you gone? How far have you gone without me, my child? I knew right away what he meant by it by how far have I gone. I felt like there's been something missing deep inside of my heart. No matter what I did, what I ate, or who I was with, and I just felt unsatisfied. And I began to weep. And I cried and cried and cried. And then the Lord began to minister to my heart. So I want to ask you the same question. How far have you gone? How far have you gone mentally? How far have you gone with your depression and anxiety? How far have you gone spiritually? Some of you, including myself, once were burned with passion for Jesus, and it just doesn't feel the same anymore. Some of you are in, the back, in that dark place trying to fight with sins and issues by yourself. And I just cannot help but hearing him saying, how far have you gone, my child? Maybe the prodigal son felt a similar thing. The void in his heart, just unsatisfied with his life, even with the father. So he wanted to live a life, abandon life of a reckless living. He thought that if he would just run out away, uh, ran out and from his father and do everything he ever wanted, Maybe that would bring satisfaction to fill that void, but it only gets worse. We all have this place. It's this dark, dark place, a place that we're feeding the pigs. Until our hearts are united with our Father, until we go back to the Father, there will be no true satisfaction. Because if you look at verse 17, it's in that place, in this darkest hour, the prodigal son realized something that he's been missing. Verse 17 and 19. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will rise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned, against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. He came to himself. He realized, I'd rather be a slave to my father than die of hunger in this dark place. So after spending it all, did everything he could, he realized there's nothing like the father's house. It's time. It's time to come home. It's time to go back to the father. So finally, the prodigal son returns. He goes back to the father, and here's what happens. Verse 20. When he rose, came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, and he felt compassion, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. What this means is that the father had been waiting for his son 
this whole time, patiently praying. Who knows for how long he waited, day and night. Did he know he was going to come back? I'm not sure. But until his son comes back, he did not stop. That's how he was the first person who spotted the son coming towards him. Our Heavenly Father is waiting for us patiently until we go back to him. As soon as he saw him, he felt compassion, right? Compassion. Our God is a compassion God. Verse uh, in Exodus 34, 6, uh, and he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate, and ESV says merciful, and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. That word compassion uh, in Hebrew is rakum. This word also appears as a noun, uh, rakamim. And it's so interesting because they both are related to the Hebrew word for womb, rakem. The Bible project, it says the compassion, so the compassion in the Hebrew Bible is centered in a person's core. And the word invites us to imagine a mother's tender feeling for her vulnerable infant. So rakum is a word that conveys intense emotion. Sometimes it's even translated as deeply moved. But rakum isn't just an emotional word. It also involves action. And surprisingly, the word is used most often to describe God's action motivated by his compassion and his emotion. For example, when God rescued Israelites from the Egypt, right? Uh, in his, um, God hears their cries and he's moved by his compassion, his rock and meme to rescue them. Psalm 68.5 Father of the fatherless and a protector of the widows is God in his holy habitation. It's one of my favorite passages is because our God, his surroundings of his living place, his environment is full of compassion. When our God sees someone in need, someone hurt, he cannot help, but he's compelled to go to rescue them. As, as we see over and over again in Old Testament, in the New Testament, and just like why Jesus is telling this story, this is our Heavenly Father that Jesus is describing. The Father who waits for his prodigal children to come back to him. is always, always moved by his compassion. What's the first thing that the father does when he's moved by the compassion? He began to run. In Jewish culture, it's considered undignified for an elderly man to run. Not only because he's an elderly man, but because of the honor and the respect. Also, more importantly, there's no need for a wealthy man like him to run. Because he has many hired servants, he can just command the servants to do everything. So there's, he will probably never have had to run in his life, in his, his olden age. But he was filled with compassion. And when he sees his son coming back, he could not help but to run to rescue him. One of our professors uh, at our uh, seminary uh, studied the different cultures, and he explained to us, and I, I believe Pastor Chris alluded to this as well, um, Back in this time, if someone brings a shame to dishonors his family, especially his parents or her parents, that person will be stoned to death. Pretty much what the father did was telling everyone, he ran and to protect them, and says, if you want to hurt my son, you go through me. So he was protecting him. So he runs, and he embraces him, and he kisses him, which is a true sign of acceptance. Our Father runs. Our Heavenly Father is ready to run at any moment when we go back to Him. Verse, verse 21 and 24, And the Son said to Him, Father, I have sinned against the heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your Son. 
But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hands and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he's found. And they begin to celebrate. Remember the line, it was supposed to be, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your servants. That was supposed to be the line. But the father was so happy, he cut him off because he was so filled with joy that the son came back. I believe that this is what true repentance looked like. It's not just a mere confession. I know the confession is important. It is important for us to say out loud of our faults, but the repentance literally just means a turning the direction. It's changing the direction back to the Father. Change of a heart. It's time to go back to the Father. Lastly, and I would love to uh, to look into the three gifts that the Father gave to the Son and uh, and what that means for us. Uh, Verse 22, But the Father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and the shoes on his feet. The best rope. Bring quickly the best rope and put it on him. I have a prop here. This is not the best rope. It's just a, a rope that I found. So, it's not just a rope. It says it was the best rope. Why the best rope? Remember, he was working with the pigs, right? So he probably hasn't taken showers, so he probably stank really bad, physically. But what about emotionally? He was filled with shame. Remember the line, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. So he was saying to himself over and over again, I'm a sinner. I can't believe what I've done. I'm such a failure So what the father did was covering his shame. This is a medium size. Hopefully it works. When Jesus died on the cross, our perfect sacrifice the Lamb of God, his robe was stripped away. Matthew 27, 31. When they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own claws on him and led him away to crucify him. Jesus' robe was stripped away so that we can be covered by his robe. The best robe. It is through the cross, through the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, we can be covered by his robe. Despite of our reckless living, all the things that we've done, no matter what we did, when we go back to the Father, he gives us and he covers us with this robe. I pray that you can also feel this robe, this best robe today. When you, when you are so filled with shame and guilt and you cannot help to condemn yourself, I pray that you can feel that God's best robe that our Father is putting on you. His perfect love that casts out all fear, all shame and guilt. It's time to go back to the Father. And we have this ring. Put a ring on his hands. This ring isn't just an ordinary ring. It was a special ring. According to a commentary, it says, the ring may have contained a seal indicating that he, the prodigal son, has been reconciled and welcomed back as a full member of the family. It was a family's signet ring, the father's ring, to mark him 
as a member of the family. When the father was putting the ring on his son's hand, he was saying to him, remember this. Remember, son. Don't you ever forget that you are my son, that you are my child. You belong here. So now, no matter where he went, whatever he did, the prodigal son, when people saw that ring, they knew that he belonged to the Father. When Jesus died on the cross, instead of having his own ring of the Father, his hands were pierced so that we can have his ring. Our Father has proven through the sacrifice of his son Jesus. He's saying to you, you are my child and you belong to me. Let's not forget who you are and whose you are and where you belong. And then the shoes, last but not least, it's just random shoes, it's not prodigal son's shoes. It's probably sandals, you know, back then, but this is what I had. So, um, a long time ago when I first read this, I was a little thrown up. Like, why shoes, you know? It's like a new kicks, is Nike easy or something? Like, why the new shoes? Remember when the prodigal left? He had a lot of money. So he probably bought like a supercar or a super camel with a crazy 500 camel power or something like that. And how far did he go? It was a far, far country. It wasn't just a nearby city or nearby town. It was a different country. And after he spent everything and had nothing left, he most likely didn't have shoes. And even he had it, he had to walk for so long who knows, it could have been weeks or months, that his feet, his feet were probably all blistered and bruised up. That's why the father gave him the new shoes to comfort, comfort his pains and his sufferings. When Jesus died on the cross, he didn't have the shoes from the father. Instead, his feet were pierced with a nail so that we can have his shoes. Shoes that comforts us from our pain and sufferings with the love of the Father. On his way back, the son took, you know, every step that son took was so much pain. Every step. He had to walk for miles and miles with all that condemnation, right? And now that every step he takes, he feels the love of the Father. Every step. A missionary once told us a story of how her five-year-old son, uh, her five-year-old son was having the same dream every night, almost every night, for months. In the dream, he was in heaven, so the mom asked him, hey, son, what, what, that's amazing. Like, what is that like? What's the heaven like? You know, is there a big house or animals? You know what the son said? The son said, mom, it's amazing because every time I take a step, I hear father saying, I love you, son. And then he would say back, I love you too, dad. And he would take another step, and he hears the same voice, I love you, son. And he'll say back, I love you, dad. Over and over and over again. This is what heaven's going to look like. For eternity, we get to hear our father saying to us, I love you, my child. And we say to him, I love you too, dad. Over and over again. 
the prodigal son who recklessly squandered everything, went back, went to that darkest place, comes home, it reunites with his amazing father. I would like to invite Esther if you can uh, come up. And remember when the son coming back, he was rehearsing that line, condemning himself. I'm a sinner. I'm not worthy to be my father's son. I'm a sinner. I'm not worthy to be my father's son. But now that every step he takes, now he knows. I am his son. My father loves me. I am his son. My father loves me. Every step he takes, not only he knows, but he, now he can feel it with the garments around his back, with the ring on his finger, with the shoes on his feet, that every step he takes, not only he knew, he thought he knew, but now he feels it from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, the amazing love of our Father. We don't have enough time to look at uh, the first son. He was just mad, you know, just like the first, you know, born always do. <laughs> As the father was celebrating that the return of this younger brother, you know, his reckless leaving, he thought that he had to work, the firstborn thought that he had to work to earn his sonship and prove to his father the worthy of being a son. But father reminds him that he's been his son all along. This was towards the Pharisees and the scribes who were grumbling against Jesus. I pray that every one of us will not only know, but encounter and experience the love of God, the robe that covers your shame, the ring that screams his sonship, his daughtership, his childship, of how he is your father, he's our father, and the shoes that comforts us from all your pains and hardships. Our Heavenly Father, who is compassionate, is waiting for us, ready to run and embrace you with these precious gifts. He'll be filled with joy and he cannot help to share with others. It's time. It's time for us to go back to the Father. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. God, I just want to say I'm sorry for the times that we have forgotten you. times that you were keep telling us how much you love us that we didn't even hear it God at times in the darkest places Lord that you're telling us that you care for us that we belong to you Lord God I pray right now every single one of us Lord for those who are listening or might watch Lord later too Father I pray that you will fill their hearts with the spirit of adoption that they will know in their hearts, in their minds, Lord, that they belong to you. The Spirit of God would scream out that you are my child, that you belong to me. And God, I pray for those who may not even know you, who may not even experience this love of the Father. God, I pray that you will work in their hearts, that would you draw them near to you, even to us to share about you, Jesus. Help us, God. Help our church, help our pastors, elders, leaders, volunteers, all of us, Lord, to come back home, to go back to you. Father, we love you. Father, we cannot wait to be with you for eternity and say how much we love you, God. God, we give you praise and honor and glory all to you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are here 
and turning lives around I worship you I worship you You are here mending every heart I worship you I worship you You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are That is who you are That is who you are to you This is who I am, child of the Most High God. Pastor Peter, thank you. Powerful, powerful word. Man. I hope uh, I, I hope you can think of about three people that you're going to go home and grab your your church app or go on YouTube and forward that and send that message. That's uh, that that message will, is going to have a lasting effect. So, uh, Peter, thank you. Beautiful. I bless you. Let's stand and we'll just bless the Lord together. Thank you, God. Come on, church. Let's just bless the Lord. You're good, Lord. Faithful, 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 Lord. Oh, faithful are you, God. Thank you for your goodness and your mercies. Continue to do a great work among our young people, this next generation, Lord, that you're raising up. We say yes and amen to what all the work you're doing and our part in participation of that. To God be all the glory. Let it be in Jesus' name. Amen. Remind you as you're headed out, uh, this, uh, Cheryl's updated prayer lists are back there. God, folks, I just want to encourage us. I, I'm, I'm in the middle of it just like you. There's so much news. There's so much. It's so much noise. Stay on our knees. It is essential. We're not going to look like 2020 again. It, the church was so divisive and so yucky. We're going to stay centered on Jesus Christ and him alone. Amen. So I just encourage you, keep focused on prayer, keep trust in the Lord, and then from that position, do a great and responsive work in the voting booths and all the other places. I bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Again, church, to God be all the glory forever and ever. Amen. We love you. God bless you. Amen.